Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. <laughs> I didn't. Ambassador Udina made me take her along. Normally I don't have anything nice to say about politicians, but he made a good call on this. However, I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Yeah, Tally was kind of forced on us, from our opinion. I mean, for on raw talent, and yeah, we take her, but it's kind of like sovereignty. It's okay, it's kind of childish actually, in that uh, we want to take her, but we want to take her on our terms. We want to be the one to extend the offer rather than have it imposed on us. Anyway, there's a few things we can ask Adams. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo, only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation, too easy for sensors to pick them up, unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself, no emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up to FTL blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Yeah, very useful to have a stealth ship, especially a, uh, it was a small one like this. We can get blown out of the void, uh, if you can hide. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive cord like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype, cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I didn't bring you along to admire my ship. I know I am here. I'll do whatever I can to help you stop Saturn and drive his Geth armies back beyond the Vale. Now, Tally's got quite a lot to talk about. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government. 
The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. Yeah, it seems pretty stable and quite democratic considering the circumstances. You'd think they'd have stronger executive power, but it's limited to a conditional veto. Interesting. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. Now, the interesting thing about losing your immunity is that if you're in a sterile environment, you don't magically lose your immunity. What happens is the genetics behind the strength of the immune system. Uh, yeah, immune system. The immune system is no longer selected. It, it is no longer something of natural selection. It doesn't matter. So, people with strong immune systems, people with weak immune systems, will pass on their genes. It's a non-factor. Uh, reproduction will be decided by other means. So. Yeah, you are going to end up with a slightly weaker immune system overall uh, in most people because you no longer have it as a factor to consider in reproduction. But the real cause of Aquarian's problems is that they grew up in a world without insects. And um, that means that a lot of diseases can spread, uh, didn't grow the same way we had epidemics. So that they have weaker immune systems overall since for most of their history it hasn't been a big issue genetically whether you have a, a strong, naturally strong immune system. And that hits you hard when you bump into a b bunch of species who do have naturally strong immune systems like humans and Krogan and so on. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. Hmm, and what qualifies as worthwhile would be a small ship. I want to talk about something else. Like what? Okay, and now the big question, the gap. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. 
It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. You had to know it would blow up in your face. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. That doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. You didn't really think they'd just let you destroy them without a fight, did you? The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Vale. Now, we drift through space, exile, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. You got what you deserved. <laughs> we made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place, but we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren. And that's why we have to stop him. Yeah. The Geth issue is quite interesting. In that... The Quarians fired first, and it's quite judgmental to say that synthetics would just turn on you because they have no use for you. Indeed, if something has no use for you, it probably won't bother interacting with you that much. Um, 
it, it's an interesting question and one that's addressed a bit further on Mass Effect 2. Hopefully it will be completely rounded out in Mass Effect 3 um, when we look further into quarry and life. But I just want to see if we can get that chain of conversation going again. I want to know more about that. I doubt I can tell you. Ask you about that. I'll come. But one thing we underestimated was... What made them rebel? One day, as you can imagine, okay. this caused a near panic. What did you do? It, a general order went out across all... The, the, we feared the Geth would pursue so us. Right. You got what you deserve. We, if, why do you think they cut themselves off That's from right. the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? I want to see what she responds to. I'm not surprised. You didn't give them a real good first impression. You really think things would be any different if we'd waited for them to act first? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. There we go. See you later. Yeah. For us, that's not so simple. And Batarians are the enemy because they've proven themselves to be utter bastards time and time again. But something like the Geth, you know, you've got to give peace a chance. Especially seeing as you fired first. And they got what they deserved in terms of you know, they live with the consequences of the decision. They they chose to go down the path of constantly enhancing VI protocols, um, which led to AI, probably not entirely inadvertently. I don't imagine them being quite as innocent as that. And uh, yeah, foreseeable consequences occur. Now, Presley, are you going to talk to us? Yes. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. I'm in charge here, Presley. I decide if we have non-humans on this vessel. Yes, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. Hmm. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. Some people think asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's just being stupid and stubborn. No matter how strong you are, allies can make you stronger. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander, this won't be a problem. Yeah, it's a valid concern, but we need to stamp Parata down uh, on the crew, I think. Also seeing as I don't think it's fair to suspect any of the people we've picked up so far of spying on us or anything like that, just because they're members of a different species. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school, following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were at Elysium during the Skillian Blitz. A massive fleet of alien raiders hit the colony, trying to wipe it out. They had the numbers, but their ships were no match for an Alliance frigate. It was a slaughter. We couldn't even keep track of how many ships they lost. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. So, as you can probably tell, we have a crew of some of the best in the Alliance. Uh, Princess Adams served on practically every ship in the fleet. Joker, top of flight school. Presley, um, served on the Scillian Blitz, personally requested. So on. Yeah, so on that note, with this new frigate our command and the galaxy figuratively at our fingertips, um, let's end things here and next time we'll be heading off to Ferros to investigate uh, Geth activity there. We've got Geth in the tower! Protect the heart of the colony! You're here for the Geth, aren't you? Who else is looking for the Geth? They're a thorn in the side of the- ah! I'm trying to get to the- Dying! 